What a great joy to celebrate Sunday service together. And now we should enter into the word of God. And I want to reconnect to what I was what I was speaking about uh, in September uh, on the topic what is your goal for for this year 2020. And I spoke from Paul's life from from two questions when he met Jesus for the very first time. And he had two questions there. Who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? And he was instructed to enter the city of Damascus. And there he was praying. And while he was praying, uh, Ananias was coming to him with a message from heaven. And we can read from Acts chapter 22 and verses 14 to 15. Here it says, Then he, Ananias, said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. And you will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. So how is it that Paul could do so much for God? It's because that this very first question, who are you, Jesus, was kept alive in his heart for the entire of his life. He had this longing, I want to know Christ. And that is exactly what needs to be kept alive in our hearts as well. This longing to know Jesus. And John chapter 17 verse 3 says that this is eternity that they may know you. So I spoke on on the three parts here from verse 14 on how to get to know Jesus, to getting to know his will, to seeing him and to hearing his voice. And from that passion, we are then motivated to do the second part of our calling, which is described here in verse 15. To be a witness. And it's not just a task among other tasks, something that we should just tick off our to-do list. No, this is about an identity, to be a witness. And it says that a witness is telling about what they have seen and heard. And how do you get those experiences? I mean, we can observe Jesus from a distance. I mean, we might see what he's doing and and also maybe hear what he's saying. But something that you observe from a distance can be perceived wrongfully. But it's when we get close, it becomes clear. And if we get really close, we can also feel the heartbeat of Jesus. And what is it that Jesus' heart is beating for? Let's go to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. And if you have your Bible with you nearby, please go with me there to Matthew chapter 9 and from verse 35. And here it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Let's pray together now. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that your heart is always beating for people. You are longing for people. You are reaching out to people. And I pray right now, this moment, that you will touch our heart. That what is beating, uh, what, what your heart is beating for, should also be what our heart is beating for. I pray for that. Holy Spirit, touch our heart. Revive the gospel and make us bold to be a witness for you. I pray for that in the name of Jesus. Amen.
So we see here in Matthew chapter 9 and from verse 35 and onwards that Jesus' heartbeat is really for people. For those who have not yet heard the gospel, for those who are in need. And that means that God's heart is beating for, for everyone. God's heart is beating for you. He cares so much for you. And when you come close to him and feel his love, he also wants that you take that love, take that warm with you and give it to others. So what do you have to give? What does that warmth consist of? Yeah, what did Jesus give? We saw that Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom and healed all manner of diseases and ailments. Jesus gave and lived out the gospel of the kingdom of God. So the gospel is really what you and I have. And what is that about? Jesus defines that very clearly when he's quoting the words of the prophet Isaiah in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. So please go there together with me. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. 18. And we should read from that. Here it says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So the gospel speaks about freedom for those who are bound or oppressed. It talks about hope to the poor, vision for the blind, and mercy to the one who is doomed to fail. And let's be honest, sometimes we just fail to see the things that we really have. Just take a look at our community. Mental illness is spreading, the crime is increasing, diseases are taking people's lives, and hatred is spread, not least in the social medias. And who's got the answer to all these problems? Is it our prime minister, Stefan Löfven? God bless him and we'll keep praying for, for him and all the authorities. But it's not the politicians who have the answers for these problems. It's you and I, because we are carrying the gospel of Christ. And this gospel, it carries power. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, even death is defeated. It's talking about the love that gave everything, that can transform us deeply. It's giving forgiveness, a pure conscience. Just think about all those many people that are torment tormented with a bad conscience. And it's talking about a God who is expert on impossible situations. He can make the impossible possible. That's the gospel that you and I are carrying with us. Paul says in Romans 1.16, listen to this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. My friend, the gospel is the power of God. The word for power in Greek is dynamis. It's talking about dynamite. You and I, we're carrying dynamite with us. And we need to realize the power that we have, which can set people free from the shackles of sin. Us realizing that we are carrying this message and to stir it up, it's absolutely crucial. You have the best message in the world. Or let me put it like this, even better, we have a supernatural message. It gives you and me boldness. So connecting the gospel to what Jesus has done in your life, your testimony, that's dynamite. I remember when I was a, a, a telephone salesman 
uh, during the year when I was in, in Bible school. And I was uh, selling socks. And I know a lot about those socks. I knew the different materials that were there. But sometimes I got the question, have you tried them? And the stupid thing that was that I hadn't tried them. And I mean, this is really the key. The knowledge combined with what we have seen and heard, that makes things dynamite when we are about sharing the gospel and our testimony. And you might say, but I don't have an extraordinary testimony. I've only lived an ordinary life and I don't have any radical, radical repentance to tell about. But Jesus did not have either. And apparently it worked very well for him. It was a powerful testimony that he had. Because a testimony that you have been kept in your faith by God's grace, even if all the darkness that prevails around you, that is one of the most powerful testimony that you can tell. So what is our calling? What did God say to Paul through Ananias? It was to be a witness of what you have seen and heard. You don't need to be an expert or, or, or think that you should conceive, uh, convince others. That is the task of the Holy Spirit. And we simply should tell about what we, the things that we have seen and heard. And it removes unnecessary pressure from your shoulders. Yes, but it's still challenging to be a witness, you might say. Yes, it is. But God knows that. And he is equipping you for this specific purpose. Hear what's, what what's he's saying in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And it's Jesus talking to his disciples. He's talking to you and I. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the same word for power, dynamis, is here as well. You have dynamite. You have dynamite power by the Holy Spirit to be a witness for Christ. And that makes you bold. And then you might say, but how should I share my faith? Then I would like to recommend you to listen to Pastor Joachim's message on this with the topic, how to share the gospel. And his message is available on Leave It Sword Play on, on the YouTube. So remember, the Holy Spirit is with you. He stirs up the gospel inside you and he gives you dynamite power to be a witness for him. All right, now back to Matthew chapter 9. We read again from verse 36. Here it says that when Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw people. It's a difference between to see and to see. One example with a blind man in, in the New Testament that we can read about. He was blind and he came to Jesus and Jesus prayed for him. And Jesus asked him, what do you see? Well, I see people, but they look like trees. And unfortunately, this is how we sometimes or often see people. We don't see the actual people. They become like trees for us. And then Jesus touched his eyes again and he asked, what do you see now? Now I see clearly. Now I see the people. And we should really pray that God touches our eyes so that we see people in the same manner as Jesus is seeing people. So how does Jesus see people? One more example of Zacchaeus. Uh, we read about him. He was living in Jericho. And uh, 
he was working actually for the occupying forces, the Romans, and he was bringing in customs from his own people. And he cheated uh, people on money. He was a villain. The people hated people like Zacchaeus. And what did Jesus do when he saw Zacchaeus? Did he start to confront him, telling him, you villain, you should be ashamed of what you're doing. No, he said, Zacchaeus, today I want to come home to you and visit you. He looks past the external action and he sees a heart that needs help. A heart that longs for Jesus. And he had such a strong longing that was even climbing up a tree in order to have the opportunity to see Jesus. And what happened then when Jesus said, I want to come home to you? Zacchaeus rejoiced. He was so happy. And if someone comes close to Jesus, then that person feels Jesus' heartbeat. A heart full of love, pure, true love, without any selfish motives, which has only one thing in mind, to rehabilitate and save. As Jesus himself is saying in this story from Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the son of man, he came to seek and to save the lost. That is the heart of Jesus. And that meeting, that close, intimate contact with Jesus, that transformed Zacchaeus' heart. He completely turned around and started handing out his belongings to the poor people and paid back many times over to those that he had stolen from. I think we tend to start at the wrong end. We look at external behavior and are appalled by sinners and judged people here and there. But God does not look on the outside. He looks at the heart. And he knows that it is the heart that is sick and in need of healing. And he does not deny sin. On the contrary, it was precisely sin that made Jesus to die on the cross for you and I. He don't compromise, but he knows that if I can come close to somebody, if I can feel that if they can feel my heart and my love, that heart will be transformed. That is the longing. That is the passion of Jesus. No matter how sick the heart might be, nothing is stronger than the love of God. It overcomes everything. So what does Jesus' heartbeat express? It expresses compassion in action. Jesus is not terrified by sin. It says that he has mercy on the sinner. Let's look at verse 36 again here. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion. This very word, it, it speaks about to be touched in the innermost being. It really touches somebody's heart. So it's not about standing in a distance and feel pity for, for somebody. No, it's something that really touches the innermost being. And we read harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Think of Jesus' words on the cross when he was hanging there and suffering immensely for you and I. There he's saying, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. So how does God's merciful love reach people today? How do we see it in action? Let's continue reading verses 37 to 38. Then he said to his disciple, disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. 
So how do we see it in action? We see that he turns to his disciples, to you and me, to his congregation. And he asks each and every one of us, is the heartbeat also your heartbeat? Is what my heart is beating for, is also your heart beating for that? Do you want to feel my heartbeat for the people who are broken, confused, blinded, beaten, and in need of true love? Those who lack a shepherd, someone who really cares about them, are you ready to care for others? What Jesus is urging his disciples to do is not to become a solo artist. He talks about workers in plural. Because this is not about being a super evangelist. No, this is about a, a people working together in the fields to harv for the harvest. The service of every believer. So where are these harvest fields? It's right where you are. It's at your workplace, your school, among your neighbors and friends, in your football team, in your housing association. That's where you are called to be a witness of Jesus. And you might say, but I'm not allowed to talk about Jesus at my workplace. Well, maybe not with words, but remember that your deeds speak all the time, often even louder. And when they see that there is something different about you, the questions will come. And I know from my own experience, when I grew up, I was part of many different sports teams. And they knew that I was a Christian. It wasn't that they were asking questions all the time. But then when we had a party together, or uh, if we went by bus to, to a game, or, or, or if we were at the tournament, the questions started to come. And I remember a specific, uh, specific, specific situation uh, when, I, when we were on a tournament and we were watching a game together and uh, there was a, a, one of my teammates who sat beside me and I was wearing a ring where it said true love waits, that I was waiting um, for, for sex until marriage. And I knew that my teammate, he was definitely not living that kind of life. And when he asked the question, what is that, what kind of ring is that? My heart was starting to beat because I, th I thought, how would his reaction be here? Would he be angry or would he like uh, laugh scornfully? Uh, but when I told him, he was sitting quiet for a while. And then he said, this is really how I would like to live. And I was quite shocked at that answer because we don't know what's happening inside of people. We see the, the outside, but God is constantly working on the hearts of the non-believers. He's, he's loving them so much. He's loving every people, all people. And you and I, we are called to be a witness there. But you might be saying, Pastor, there is a pandemic going on. I have worked from home for eight months now. How am I expected to reach my coworkers? I think it's the right time now to be, to be really bold. When you are, are in a video call, for example, before you start the meeting, ask the person, how are you? How do you cope with this pandemic? And then you listen and probably you will get the, the, the same question back. You can just be honest and say, how you feel in this situation. And then you have the opportunity to, to tell them about your Christian faith and how that is giving you strength through this difficult situation and period that we are in. Or maybe you can do a smart product placement. When you are having that conversation, put your, your Bible or your devotional book there. And maybe they will ask, oh, what kind of book is that? Then you can just tell them, oh, this is actually my favorite book. Can I read something for you that I read this morning? Pray the Holy Spirit to be creative in this time, to make the most of every opportunity, to be a witness where you are. And look at it in this way. 
There are four weeks now until Advent. And we are heading towards a Christmas that will be very different from, from the Christmas we have had before. And now we have a God-given opportunity to take advantage of this time. When the gospel will be played through the speakers in the shops. And when at the same time people are more lonely than ever. Now is our time, friends. Now is it the time to shine for him. Because you are carrying that dynamite power inside of you. What will be uh, played in the speakers, uh, the gospel, that's actually what you are carrying inside of you. Now is the time to shine his light. Now is the time to ask God for the grace to see people as he sees them. Now is the time to act passionately and have the courage to take the initiative to spread the gospel and God's love. And this is a lifestyle that God is challenging you and I to live. Not a solar artist, as I mentioned before, but united as God's people, expressed through the local church. Each believer side by side, where each one is a worker in the harvest fields. Now is a golden time to start this lifestyle. And I would like to, to share a testimony. It's from Christine's Instagram. Christine is one of the overseers of Grottan, uh, our day shelter for homeless people. And, and she was writing this. Listen to this. Think that good deeds towards our fellow human beings can be like light in the dark. For the third year in a row, the man called Grottan today. He wants to buy Christmas presents for my guests, about 40 gifts. I would, it would be so easy for him to send money for the gifts, and it would have been big enough. But the beauty of this is the love and care that he puts into the Christmas presents. We think a little together on the phone about what could be a good Christmas present. We talk about sizes, colors and different options. That I get the joy of handling out these Christmas presents is just a bonus and joy for me. But when I do, and at the same time tell my friends that this Christmas present is not from this agency, but from a private person who cares very much about them, then I see that the love goes straight into their hearts. We end the conversation by stating that the wounded and beaten people that Grottan meets are so close to God's heart. God always reaches out to the weak and broken. You will be happy to give if it's just a Christmas present. What a wonderful opportunity we have. And you might say, I can't afford to buy 40 Christmas presents. But maybe you can make one Christmas present to somebody around you. For a neighbor, for example. Or maybe you are a family together and, and your children can make some drawings and, and give to an elderly person uh, nearby you. And maybe the leaves that are cov covering the grass, um, your grass, it's also covering your neighbor's grass. And maybe you can make it uh, clean even for him. So where are you? What is the name of your harvest field? What do you have near? Who do you have near? Who need God's love? Who does God call you to be a witness for? And I believe that right now, the Holy Spirit, is, it's touching your heart. He's moving right now. And he wants to draw you close to Jesus so that you might feel his heartbeat for those around you who need him. And what is the first step? If we continue to read here in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38, it says, Ask the Lord. 
the answer, the first step is always prayer. Everything must be born in prayer. We need to ask for workers for the harvest. Workers who realize the power of the gospel, who see people as Jesus sees them and who feel the heartbeat of God and are fertilized by the same passion that Jesus has for people that it is translated into action. Do you want to be such a worker? If you say yes to that question, if that is your longing, I want to be a worker, I want to be the witness that, that God is calling me to be. If that is your longing, your prayer, just put your hand on your heart as a sign to God that you are saying yes, I want to be this worker. Holy Spirit, come and touch my heart. Let me feel your heart beat, that my heart will beat for the same thing as your heart is beating for, for people around me. Father, we thank you right now. We thank you that you are our good, good Father, that you love us so much. We thank you that we have encountered that love. And Father, we pray, oh, that you oh, stir up through your Holy Spirit, the gospel, the power of the gospel inside of us so that we go, Father, so that we see people the way we, that you are seeing them, so that we love the same way as you are loving people. Father, I pray that this Christmas time that you oh, help us to be bold, to reach out to people, to make the most of every opportunity, to be a witness. I thank you, Father. And you see each and every one oh, that is longing for, for this right now, that want to be a witness for you. I thank you that the Holy Spirit inside of them are stirring up the boldness right now, oh, giving them creative ideas how to reach out. I thank you, Father, for it. Come, Holy Spirit. We need you. We need you to be bold, to be witnesses for you. I thank you, Father, that you are coming right now. Oh, you are, you are reviving us. Oh, you are renewing this longing to be, be a witness. Father, I thank you and I pray for it. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. This is so important. And remember, the Holy Spirit is with you. He is giving you strength. And He wants you to be a witness. And everywhere that you are going, He is with you all the time. So I really encourage you to, to take this message with you, to, to read those, those uh, passages that we have read now, and, and let the Holy Spirit lead you to, to people. And it's one more thing that I, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants us to do now. And it's really to think about one person. One person that do not know Jesus yet. Uh, one person that you know. It could be a family member. It could be a neighbor. Uh, somebody at your workplace. Or uh, somebody that you study together with. Think about one person now. And let it be as as uh, concrete that you, that you know, if, if I will ask you right now, who's that person's name, you would just say it. And now when you have that person, you're thinking about that person, let us unite in prayer now. And when we pray, let us believe that the Holy Spirit is moving right now. And even now, He's both giving you creative ideas, but He's also starting to work with that heart. Hallelujah. So Father, we lift up all those people that we have in mind right now. Father, we thank you that you are reaching out to those people right now. Father, we pray, help us to make the most of the opportunity that we have when we meet them, Father. Uh, maybe we'll meet them the coming week, Father. Help us there to be a witness of your love in our actions and when we have the opportunity also by our words. I thank you, Father, for boldness. Oh, I thank you, Father, for your ways. Oh, for your keys, how to reach those people. I thank you that you, Holy Spirit, is right now touching those uh, people that we are praying for. We thank you, Father, for it. We're lifting those people up to you. And we believe, Father, for salvation to each and every one of them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.